one. This week on Stogie Geeks, we are, we are joined by Jonathan David of Toasted Foot, where we'll catch up on the foot and all things IPCPR. Our debonair idea will talk about IPCPR after hours, and our Stogies of the Week will also be IPCPR focused, so stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. Paying homage to the mecca of tobacco, Pinar del Rio, Cuba, Abe Flores opened his PDR cigar factory in the Dominican Republic over 10 years ago. Abe is one of the hottest boutique cigar makers in the industry today, earning the number 10 spot on Cigar Aficionado's Top 25 Cigars of 2014 with the Abe Flores 1975 Siri Pravada. Abe and his team use Cuban blending traditions in a modern boutique Dominican factory. Smoke PDR cigars and cut light and taste what they love to do. M. Bombay cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay cigars are then rolled in Costa Rica by some of the most experienced cigar rollers, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try the M. Bombay Casera, M. Bombay Mora, and the recently released M. Bombay Havana. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. Uh, I love that I get to smoke cigars and call it work. Hey, Paul. What's going on, cigar newbie? I'm halfway through this cigar you gave me, and uh, I was wondering if I could put it out and save it for later. Uh, no. Well, uh, I wanted to try the Liga Pravada with the Connecticut wrapper. And I was wondering if I, where I could get some of those. Um, yeah, so those don't exist. Hmm. Well, I also have some of the cigars you gave me from before, and I was wondering if I could store them in my refrigerator. Only if you're going to eat them. Don't be like Mark. Subscribe to Stogie Geek Shorts with Paul and Will, a 10-minute show about all things cigar smoking. We provide tips and tricks on humidification, cigar storage, mini reviews on select cigars, accessories, and more. Stogie Geek Shorts is one-stop shopping for learning about which cigars to smoke and the right way to cut, light, and store your favorite Stogies. You can watch Stogie Geek Shorts on our YouTube channel or subscribe using your favorite podcast app. For all the latest episodes, visit stogieshorts.tv. Hey, Paul. This cigar is awesome, and I wanted to share it with you, and I was going to cut it in half. Oh, boy. You need to watch Stogie Geek Shorts. Welcome, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode 195. I'm Will Cooper. I'm manning the controls from Studio C in North Carolina. Um, up in the G-Unit studios, we have Mark and the team um, carrying things through. Paul is actually out today, and Paul is actually in Las Vegas, where I just got back from from the IPCPR trade show. And Paul's actually out there for um, some security conference. So... Um, who's got the better end of the deal, so to speak, there. Um, but uh, we have a really great show tonight because we are going to be talking IPCPR, and we have one of the best guys in um, the cigar media um, to join me, and I've been wanting to get him on the show a long time. And we're going to be – we'll catch up on his brand, and then we'll kind of get into IPCPR. We have uh, Mr. Jonathan David of Toasted Foot on the um, – uh, line. Uh, before we start, hey, uh, for the production guys, I, I know a couple of folks were having trouble getting into the chat room. If you guys could check that, that would be great. But, uh, JD, welcome to the Stogie Geek Show. Thanks, Coop. Glad to be here. Hey, we're, we're really glad to have you. Like I said, this is, uh, I've been wanting to have you on for a while, and um, you were at the uh, trade show. We, we did catch up. Always great catching up with you this week. Um, but kind of just to, um, to start things off, um, Jonathan, you're with, a, um, you're with Toasted Foot. Um, 
And I want to get into a little bit about Toasted Foot before we kind of get into the IPCPR particulars. And one thing I've liked about what you've done with Toasted Foot is Toasted Foot is, is really one of those established cigar media sites. I mean, it's been in operation a lot longer than, than we've been. And I think you guys, and in particular what you've done over the past few years, is you've, you've been able to kind of bridge from what I would say 2008 uh, cigar media blogging to like 2016. You've been able to keep that going. So, you know, I'm a fan of the site. But why don't you just give us a little background on um, – Toasted foot, or as I call it, the foot, or as you call it, the foot. Uh, <clears throat> as far as I know, we are the oldest still operating, continually operating site. We're like the La Aurora of cigar blogs. Um, I took over in three and a half, well, about three and a half years ago, four years ago. And uh, the goal was to kind of keep a consistency between what had come before and what we do now, uh, while kind of updating it for what's happening now in the cigar industry and bringing back some of the older features that might've gone by the wayside and things like that. So you know, we normally do a new review every, uh, every other day. And, uh, you know, we keep up with the press releases somewhat. We're not as great on the news as uh, cigar coop here, but we do our best. I think what toasted foot has done really, really strong is you have a lot, you, you really engage your audience very well. Um, and not only that, you, and I'm not just talking about the readers, but you know, the cigar industry is a part of that audience as well. I mean, a lot of people in the cigar industry, they follow what we all do. And I think you've done a real, real solid job at, you know, just some of the like, what's in your humidor, you know, talk about some of those things that you've kind of implemented or carried over maybe from the original toasted foot. Actually, most of that stuff is stuff that I brought back that um, back in 2008 when Toasted Foot started. I mean, it was the first cigar site I remember reading. Um, I know I talked to a couple other guys who were like, hey, it's the first one I remember reading. And uh, some of the features that were really cool kind of fell by the wayside, like um, what's in your humidor, where we asked different manufacturers and retailers uh, what's in their humidor. Uh, Actually, the first guy ever to do it was Mike Herklocks back when he was at Davidoff. And um, I thought it'd be kind of neat to see what some of those guys are, are smoking now. You know, we did one uh, with you, Cigar Dojo, uh, Rocky Patel. And uh, we try and span the range from retailers to media guys to manufacturers and uh, get an idea of what people are smoking, what's new, what they like, what some of their all-time favorites are. Um we brought back right now, it's still a little sporadic because we're getting back in the swing of things, but uh, Toast of the Week where we uh, feature what's on everybody else's site. And we say, hey, you know, this is what we thought of this cigar, but maybe Coop's opinion's different. And uh, go check out what he did. One thing that, that, that I've really liked what you've done with that in terms of, you know, with the other sites um, I've called it, and I know I've talked to a lot of folks, is, yeah, we're competitors, but it's more of a co-opetition. And I think really what you've done, J.D., and I really got to take your hat, is you've really promoted that. Um, you've promoted everything through the Cigar Media Association. I mean, you've done an excellent job at that. Well, I think the idea of the Cigar Media Association owes a lot to the fact that you helped found it. But, I mean, I like the idea of it, the idea of all of us co cooperating because honestly everybody's site has a different feel a different theme yeah some people are reading all the same sites but not everybody is um you know for me i go to cigar coop whenever i need news or want to know what's happening right then you know uh cigar dojo is a great site as far as uh, uh getting to interact with other smokers in other parts of the country um uh, i like developing palettes and uh Cigar Federation, I mean, I check them all out, but I think there's a place for everybody because everybody kind of has a different, you know, theme. I, I, total, I totally agree, um, you know, with that. And I think that's where, you know, and I always tell folks, you know, don't take one, don't take one site, not just for a news or a review, but you owe it to kind of check out a few points of view. 
Um, and, and you don't want to be too single-threaded. You want to get those differing points of view, um, which, which I think is real important. You know, don't, don't take my word for it because I may be completely wrong in a lot of cases. Hey, I agree with you most of the time. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple <laughs> cigars where I'm like, eh, you know, I didn't agree with Keith Coop on this one. I know there's certain times Coop looks at my site and he's like, what the hell? Um, but, you know, that's part of the difference between smokers. Everybody has a different palate and different things they like. And so it just makes sense to, to expose guys to other sites and, and what else is out there. You know, also, we're, we tend to be more reviews-focused uh, and more for the average cigar smoker. There's other sites that focus more on the, um, you know, what I like to call the cigar nerds, the guys like me that are, hey, what's new? What just happened, you know? What's the latest TAA release? Um, you know, everybody kind of has their own focus. Ours is the average guy out there at the cigar shop who wants to know more. You've also... Put in, I think your scoring system, you've gone onto the 10 point system, correct? Or you've always used it. Those total I, inherited, always used it. Uh, I inherited that system. So we kept it. It's, it's roughly the same as everybody else's. We just add a decimal point in there. Okay. The only difference from when I took over is beforehand, there was a scoring system where the pre light, which included the look of the cigar, got a certain amount. The, burn got a certain amount of points the flavor got a certain amount of points and for me that didn't make sense because you can have a really good looking cigar that completely sucks and somehow it ends up scoring really high because of that and you can have some cigars that look like crap that are great cigars and so uh, I kind of took that out of there because to me it didn't make a lot of sense yeah in fact I that's something I went through early on as well, where I was scoring appearance and what was happening is the cigar ratings were getting inflated. Because it's, and, and it was also, appearance is a very, very subjective thing. And there aren't, I mean, there are some cigars that are maybe not as good looking, but in general, I mean, it's very hard to kind of kill appearance. So I kind of just took that out along with the pre-light as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that fashion as well. Well, once in a while you get a cigar. I mean, there's there was one cigar. I can't even remember what it was now. I smoked it not long ago. And the, the cold draw on that cigar was amazing. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be a great cigar. And then I lit it up, and I was very disappointed. And so oh. by scoring it all separately and adding up the points, it would have scored a lot higher because it had a great cold draw, The you know, uh, construction was excellent the burn was good but the cigar itself you know got bitter about halfway through and uh that doesn't make any sense to me to artificially inflate that rating i i totally am on board with that as well what are you actually smoking right now i am smoking a stogie's h-town lancero i got the uh tatuaje is what i'm smoking now and i got a uh, laranja in the the works for my next cigar has the laranja been released yet it is out, yeah. And it came okay. out um, right before the IPCPR. And I would say it's probably the, if it's not the best, it's the second best of the H-Town Lanceros. That's a high rating. I mean, because there's some, there's some really good ones. I mean, you, you're smoking the Tatawai one, I think, has gotten a lot of praise. The Illusioni one, um, everyone's raving about that. I mean, I loved Matt Booth's original as well. So there's some really, really, and that's a strong, I mean, you're actually at Stogie's right now in the back room, correct? Yeah, I'm actually in the, the members only. They have a private lounge for members, and they have a conference room, and I'm here in the conference room hanging out. See, see when you get to be JD, you get the private conference rooms. You know, that's one percenters. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You know, I, I'm no JD. He's got the private, uh, I'm in the garage here. So. I aspire to be you when I grow up, Coop. Oh, stop in the garage, it, stop. my wife would let me smoke there. Oh, you see, you got to work. It, it takes a little time. It does yeah, take a little time. Like five months, so, you I know, think I you're very where she lets me smoke in the garage. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this week, obviously, um, we all got together. Um, by the way, just before I said that, I'm smoking the Avo uh, Synchro Fogata, which is the new Nicaraguan blend um, they released just before the show. I'm smoking the Short Torpedo, which... Um, 
I actually had smoked um, the Toro size. I thought it was good. The, the, I was advised to smoke this short torpedo, and this is my first time smoking it, and I'm, I'm impressed with this um, right out of the gate. So I think the short torpedo, again, we, we talk a lot about on the show, J.D., um, size matters, and every cigar we try to judge individually based on that size. Generally, when I do a review, I will smoke every size I can get my hands on and then pick the best size to do the review of. So whichever one out of them I like the best, that's generally the size you see on the site. Once in a while, there's an exception, like I couldn't find something, or in the case of the H-Towns, they only come in a Lancero. Um, but there's always, I try and always get whatever I like the best size-wise. And it varies. And you've reviewed every one of the H-Towns, with the exception of the Espinosa, right? So I think that you can all go to Toasted Foot and find, find the reviews on that. The Espinosa will be up there this week, but yes, every one of them is up there. That's excellent. That's excellent. Both Willie um, and I are big Lancero lovers, so they, you'll see a good deal of Lanceros up there. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I, I, I saw Jorge, who's the owner of Stogie's this week. He is a, a I, mean, I tell you agree, a super guy. If you're gonna, um, if you're looking to buy cigars, in particular special cigars, give him his business. He's not a sponsor here, but I'll just throw that out there um, for that. Well, if you're looking for a Lancero, there's nobody with more of them. There's 200, last time I counted, because I was writing up an article on the place, there was 200 Lanceros on the shelf, different blends. Do and I don't know any other shop in the country like that. No. that I mean, do you, you, obviously that's got to go back to Jorge, and he's able, you know, we hear Lanceros don't sell, Lanceros don't sell. But what I, when I talk to various retailers, if the retailer sells the Lancero, and what I mean is, you know, basically gets behind that Lancero, a lot of the customers will tend to follow. Is that kind of the case down there? Yeah, I mean, it's also the case with any brand. You know, I mean, if a retailer ignores a brand, maybe because the manufacturer doesn't come visit enough or whatever, you know, it does tends not to sell real well there. Uh, there's some places where Espinosa is huge, other places where he's not. You know, some places where Southern Draw is huge, other places where they're not. And uh, here, Lanceros are very big because Jorge gets behind them. He's like, you know, hey, that cigar you're smoking is a great cigar. You should try the Lancero size. And uh, pretty soon, guys are like, ah, you know, I trust Jorge. I'll try it. You know, why not? Coop, did I lose you? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I think I'm back. I think that was me. You guys see me? Yeah. I see a picture of you, but I think we lost. Okay. Yeah, I think that was my fault. I think I just was butterfingers there. Okay, so we're back. We're all good? Everyone can hear me? I can hear you, Coop. Okay. Okay, that was my fault. So, so yeah, um, turning our attention, actually, we'll move over and we'll kind of get into IPCPR. Um, the 84th annual convention and trade show, as everyone probably knows, it was held in Las Vegas last week. Uh, JD was there. I was there. Um, the guys from Developing Palettes, Cigar Federation, of course, the Dojo. A um, lot, lot of all, a lot of media there. There was there was one media person who wasn't there, and I'll, I'll kind of get into that piece a little bit uh, when we get into some of the thoughts of the trade show. Um, but. Overall, what I want to kind of talk with J.D. about is kind of get into some of the takeaways from the show. Um, what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the takeaways here from the show. And then in our Stogies of the Week, it will be an IPCPR kind of run rundown of these things. So we'll go through what some of these things are and get some, some of the specific cigar impressions um, as well. And, and I think I'm kind of curious to see. I think I know what J.D.'s cigar of the show was. Uh, we always kind of compare. Last year we were the same, but I think this year we're different. So um, we'll, we'll kind of get into that as well. Um, JD, you know, you've been, is this your fourth or fifth show you've gone to? Uh, fourth. Okay, this is my seventh um, in a row. So, and I'll kind of get into some of my thoughts on this. But um, overall impressions of, I would say, let's just talk first about the, before we kind of get the operation of the show, do you think it kind of went over smooth? Do you think it, there were some bumps? What were your thoughts on from an operational standpoint? Uh, I think it went over fairly smooth. I think, uh, you know, we had an issue. You didn't because, you know, we're not all as important as Cigar Coop. 
but uh, a lot of the media guys couldn't get in at the time they were supposed to be in. Um, other than that, I think the general operation of the show went went fairly well. Yeah, and that that thing actually I wasn't in. I was actually dealing with something else. And um, yeah, I think that's just every year that's been a communication. I think it's fixable, and I think we could be more proactive certainly next year because. Uh, what JD's talking about is usually media is supposed to get onto the show floor an hour early. Um, it seems every year to be an issue because, yes, we've been told we could get on there an hour early, and then they don't tell the security people. So it's like that one little step. So And um, Vegas has very big security people. Yeah, that, yeah even JD can't, can't uh, topple this. New Orleans so, was a little easy to push past. Vegas, they're, they're uh, big. Oh, yeah. Um, my overall thoughts from an operational standpoint – um, and I'm talking from the IPCPR strictly. I think given what they were up against this year, given what they had to deal with last year. Um, so last year they had, you know, they, New Orleans had issues. I mean, they, they had lower attendance. Um, you know, there was a smoking ban. This year, obviously, in lieu of the FDA, I think they did a very good job with this show. Um, the media thing aside, that's a small – it was a small piece because overall – I thought the show flowed pretty smooth there, and um, I think they deserve a lot of credit. They, you know, IPCPR sometimes gets beat up a lot. You know, in particular, any type of organization is going to get beat up. But I think, in light of things, they they did a very solid job from that. I think the show went off pretty well with that. I would agree. I think it went really well overall. I didn't attend any of the lunchtime seminars, but I heard they were very well attended. Um, I attended the uh, one with Abe from Smoke In. Uh, because he's a buddy, and I wanted to hear what he had to say. And I thought they were were fairly well attended. And every time I walked by, and somebody else was giving one, especially the one that had Pete Johnson and Saka and all those guys, um, it was it was pretty packed. Now I was I just was slammed. I I didn't have the bandwidth. I had some concerns if they would be how they would work because you know in general people you know they either want they're either buying or they want to schmooze right. But in general, you saw that these were for the most part, that was attended and they were received well? Yeah, there was a good number of retailers there. It, it tended to be the smaller retailers. Uh, most of the bigger guys didn't have time to go, I don't think. But uh, they all seemed very well attended this year. I mean, a lot more than last year. And, and that's good. I think that this year they did a good job at promoting the seminars and obviously getting people to attend the FDA one which is, was a problem in the past. Um, and I'm sure FDA in general probably gave people the impetus to go to these things where they, they normally wouldn't go to them. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> in the past, those things tend to be, you know, it's like, ah, uh, we're getting the same seminar every year, same people. Are, this year it was uh, because of the FDA thing. I think that's another reason they were so well attended. Yep. Um, now, now, as far as the show itself goes, um, what I want to do is get into some takeaways. And, and these takeaways could be anything from general themes to companies, um, however you, you want, want to do it. Um, and what I'll, I could kick it off, just kind of give you, what, um, in a way, what I'm seeing. So here is my impression of the show. There was this thought that we have August days coming. And this was going to be the last hurrah for new product. And next year was just going to be doom and gloom. We wouldn't see any new product. I came by the end of the first day of the show. It was very clear to me. We're going to see product next year that we haven't seen before. Um, what's happening in the, in the industry that I see is there were companies that basically, there were some companies that took a lot of product to the show. There were some companies that took some product to the show and held some back. Either and But the thing is, I was told over and over from Booz, the product that was held back was sold. But it's kind of not being showcased yet. And that's why if you're reading a lot of the stuff we've been writing, if, what Half Wheel's been writing, other folks have been writing, you'll see these like October release dates, you'll see these November release, you'll see some stuff maybe early next year. That's when they're kind of what I would say is doing the rollout, so to speak. But there's but there are sales that were happening. I said some of the stuff we've seen, and then a lot of the stuff we haven't seen. In my opinion, there's enough stuff I think being held back. Where next year, yes, yeah, some of this stuff's been sold, 
And where it's going, I have an idea. I don't want to kind of get into it yet, but I, I have a good guess where it's going. But there's next year at this trade show, there's going to be plenty of product to cover it. We really haven't talked about. We, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I would agree. I'm, I don't. I'm not all doom and gloom like some people. Um, I work in the oil business during the day, so I'm already in a federally regulated industry. And uh, you know, when that came down, we thought it was all going to be doom and gloom, and it turned out not to be. I mean, things are different, and uh, not always in a good way. But I think uh, the same thing's going to happen in cigars. Things will be slightly different. You know, you're going to see an increase in prices over time, things like that. But there will be a new product, um, especially from the bigger companies, General, Altidus, Davidoff. Um, they've got enough brands that they've owned over the years. They can just re-release stuff under that brand name. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think that'll be coming. I think that Altidus bringing back poor Larry, poor Larry Yaga for something other than a TAA is kind of an example of that, you know. Um there's a lot of that sort of thing that's going to happen. No, I, I, you know, I totally agree. You know, there were, um, like I said, you know, you know, I look, for example, the Florida Minicana brought back Reserva Especial. Um, and they, they did some repackaging on it. And if you look at what we have on Cigar Coop on that, that packaging was actually, they brought back a, predi- a, a pre-predicate blend in the Reserva Especial. They are introducing some new sizes, and I guess they'll deal with that at some point. Um, but if you look at that packaging, for example, there's there's enough space where if they need to slap a warning label on it, it's it's it will be they've designed it with that in mind. So and that's a like I said, they brought back one of their that's a brand that goes back twenty years with them. So you'll you'll see some up. But there are also, like I said, there is some product that we probably haven't heard about yet that you know, and I I I would guess there's larger retailers buying that product that we're not hearing about. That would be my <laughs> Definitely that far out. Um, some of the bigger guys, you know, I also know of a couple companies that said, Hey, I just placed this with one retailer. Yep. You know, just to say it was on sale. Yep. But yep, no, exactly. Um, but I think when you're getting into some of the bigger companies who have hundreds of SKUs, they've got, you know, the most brick and mortars aren't going to be able to absorb those, those SKUs. So I'm guessing where some of that stuff, again, this is just me speculating where that may be going right now. Um, but you know, again, it's it's within the guidance. I'm more worried about the show in 2018 and 19. That's where I'm kind of. I think next year we're going to be fine. I think there's going to be a ton of product to showcase, and we'll see. It's 2018 and 19, which we has got a little more of an unknown feel right now to it. Well, I think there is a trend towards fewer people attending the show, manufacturer-wise. Fewer manufacturers attending the show. There's a couple companies that you've seen either fold or, or go under. There's also a lot of smaller companies that just it wasn't cost effective to have a booth this year. And a lot of those smaller booths that used to be in the back that there would just be rows and rows of small booths this year, not as much. No, you're, you're right. And, then you know, there were some small guys who have been at the show for several years, you know, who didn't, who weren't there this year. Like Sosa Cigars was not there. Uh, Victor Vitali of Legacy Brands was not there. Uh, Clint Aaron from 262 Cigars was not there. Um, so um, Kubanacan, that may be a different story what's happening with that, but they were not there. So, they were, I mean, these are, they're smaller companies, yes, but they're also companies that I think, they've had a lot of following and, you know, they've built up some, a nice loyal uh, following over the last year that they weren't there. Eddie Ortega wasn't there with, with quality importers either. No, I was surprised not to see him at their booth. You know, you and I uh, both published uh, right before the IPCPR about uh, Southern Draw not being there. Right. Um, I mean, there were a lot of quality companies that are still going to be around uh, for the most part, maybe not Cubanicon, but most of those companies are going to be around that um, didn't show up this year. You know, the other thing I found odd is at least since 2010, there has always been a great wall booth. Um, They don't sell any cigars. These are Chinese manufacturers, not in the U.S., Uh, but they manufacture more cigars over there than we make over here. Um, But they always have a booth just to be represented and be part of the U.S. cigar market. And I thought it was odd this year there was no great wall booth. Um, GMD uh, went out of business in 
February, and they had a huge booth the last two years. Yeah, yeah, and I was wondering where they were. I forgot about that. And they had some of the better cigars I smoked out of last year's show. I even uh, said they were one of the brands to watch after last year's show. Yeah, and, I didn't. Yeah, that, that, I didn't realize they were out of business. Yeah, February. Um, I was actually running a. Uh, it was the month after we ran a Euphoria contest, and the very next month, they were no longer around, at least in the United States. I know they're still uh, selling cigars in Europe, but uh, in the U.S. market, they're no longer around. So if you find the Euphoria or the Heritage, uh, pick them up, because those are great cigars and at the price. And uh, the fact that they're no longer around, is it's definitely worth picking up. Yeah. There were some companies that I know – kind of felt, I'm not going to name the names because I just want to be discreet, but they told me that they weren't coming. Some of them were in a one-year boat where they just wanted to really focus on FDA and that they'll be back next year. So, but some of them, you know, given the short time window, they felt they had to get their business. And I, and I think we could say Southern Draw was in, you know, based on their press release, I would say that's one of the companies that was in there. Also, you've had a lot of problems with, uh, in this this goes to everybody. You know, packaging of what you see at the show isn't always what you see on the store shelves because they're having a box shortage. Um, there's just not enough wood to make the boxes, and they're not getting them done in time, and that's a lot of companies. Yep, and you've seen them turn to jars and cans. I mean, so Monte Cristo had jars this year. Um, you know, M. Bombay de Crassier have had cans. Um, Which M. Bombay is getting rid of. They're getting rid of that. Back to boxes. I didn't know that. Um, you know, my feeling on jars and tins, and I, I love the, the de Crassier stuff and things, uh, the Atabays and the Byrons that all come in those. The problem is they don't fit on retailer shelves. And it makes it very hard to sell is my, my thought on it. And especially a great cigar, like something that comes out of M. Bombay or whatever, if it gets stuffed somewhere because it's in the back corner because that's the only place there was a shelf to set a jar, uh, that's not any good. So I think um, you're going to see a lot more boxes coming back. My, my criticism of the jars and cans aren't that I, I don't like them or even from the retail shelf point. The problem I have with it is displaying the cigar which I think is very important is it's very hard to display that cigar. Um, and then if I'm a retailer, someone's got to go in and start pulling stuff out of that can or jar. And as a result, I don't know if I like that. So I think that's where it becomes more of a challenge I've seen with that. Well, and I have the same complaint against, uh, you know, and I love Matt Booth stuff, but I have the same complaint against most of the recent room one one releases. It's very hard to, talk somebody into buying a cigar that they can't see. And when it's wrapped in tissue paper and then a piece of paper around it, you can't see the cigar you're actually buying. So guys just pass it by on the shelf. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember the Namakubi Ecuadors, uh, and I, my local retailer who uh, had brought them in, and he could not move them until he took them out of the uh, paper. Uh, looks great. The paper looks great. I love, I love the concept, but when it goes put into action, it becomes more difficult um, to do that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Same with the Leaf by Oscar. You know, great cigar. In order to sell it, because people don't realize that's not the actual cigar, um, here at Stogie's, they actually have a couple on display. So you're like, this is what you get underneath that tobacco leaf. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great, that's a, a really good idea. Did you see the new The Oscar by, yes. yeah, which has the Candela sleeve they're using? I have not smoked it yet, but I, I have seen it. And actually, he had a cigar last year at the show that hasn't come out in the U.S. It's mostly in South and C Central America, but, oh, God, that cigar, uh, La something, Reneza, it was a great cigar. Yeah, he's made some other, I've had some of these other harder to find, the Oscar Valadares cigars, um, and they've been very good. Um, he did one with a tequila kind of... Um, in, I, I guess it's an infusion. It was actually really, really good. But, you know, the interesting thing about that Oscar was it's not being distributed by Island Jim, I found out. I don't know what's up with that, but it's being distributed separately by Oscar's company. Well, that's interesting. That I didn't know. 
and they were at the same booth, and it's going to create. Let me tell you, it's going to create confusion. I don't know what what went into that decision, but it's going to be a. I mean, that's to me, that's a compliment to the Leaf cigar. I would think you'd want the same distribution team handling that. I would. I would completely agree. So I, I don't. Again, I love those guys. I'm not. And they're both friends of mine. But I, um, after they told me, and I left the booth, and I'm kind of doing my write up. Then it just. It clicked. I'm like, that's interesting. Um, n- another thing that I saw this year was AJ Fernandez, and I'm not talking about AJ Fernandez cigars, but I'm talking AJ Fernandez the blender, and he seemed to be this year's hired gun. For everyone was working with him, and for example, General's done a couple of releases. They've done a founder. They have a foundry release with AJ, as well as a Hoyo uh, release. La Polina has done an AJ Fernandez cigar, and Nick Malello has done an AJ Fernandez cigar as well with the Tabernacle. So AJ, that's something that was a little. That's something different this year. that's going on with that that I've noticed. I think um, you know. I really kind of started to notice that it wasn't at last year's show, but afterwards. Um, you had the, the Southern draw, the new world, the nomad stuff, all great cigars, all coming out of AJ's factory. And since then, he's kind of become the new Pepin in a way. He's the guy yeah. that they're going to, to make their cigars. You know, uh, you mentioned the general, there's that oil from AJ Fernandez, which was on display at both, uh, booths. Yep. Um, you know, there were a lot of guys this year that were very proud of the fact they went to AJ for their cigar. And I think for the next couple years, AJ is going to be the hot guy as far as that goes. You know, I think he's really the, right now, the new Pepe. I think, you know, that I would agree. I mean, Casa Fernandez, which is no relation to AJ Fernandez, they've kind of always done that. That's always been, they've made cigars. But, you know, AJ, AJ, you know, originally started out making cigars for other people too before you know and he was making stuff for internet and cattle before he went and um started his own thing but now this is kind of coming back full circle where you know for general to kind of be working with him on on the hoyo if you look at the packaging on the hoyo um you'll see that it's got a secondary band which is very reminiscent to the stuff you see in the aj fernandez like enclave and new world portfolio that secondary band it's very clear that it has the aj fernandez like kind of stamp on it i'm actually looking for one right now i have one somewhere here with me um that i can show you yeah right here and it has the um yep secondary band here it says, you know, AJ Fernandez, and it even has the AJ logo on the back. Um, same logo that's on the Enclave and the New World and things like that. So, yeah, so that, that was that was I thought that was very interesting. I thought it was actually a very smart move by General to do that because I think it will differentiate that. As you know, General sometimes has different reputation. You know, they have different uh, reputations to different people. I get that, but. Here, you know, you, it, it's clearly an AJ Fernandez cigar that's being, you know, marketed or distributed by General right now. I think that's a good thing to have. Uh, for, I think it's a smart move by General to do that. I, I think it definitely is. I think, uh, you know, aside from what's the, some of the foundry stuff, I think what's happening at General is they're kind of doing what Altidus did in, in um, 2012 in Orlando, which is they're going back and, uh, kind of revamping a lot of old brands and bringing things back and, and trying to get rid of that reputation they kind of developed over the last few years. Uh, bringing back the CAO Sopranos as the consigliere and things like that. That was an impressive cigar. I mean, we'll talk about it, but that was, I think I, I liked what they did with that. Um, and, you know, they were talking about how the blend was, um, the, there were two blends. And they changed from a Brazilian to a Connecticut broadleaf wrapper very early on. And I remember some of those original Brazilian ones. And they definitely tasted better. Um, you can but, still find those in the humidor. If you can you buy the, uh, if you can find somebody who's selling one of the original limited edition humidors. Right. They made 500 of them. And I've been to a couple stores where they still have one with the cigars inside. It had that original blend. Yep. 
Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a change. I didn't think the Broadway cigar was a bad cigar, but if you had those original ones, um, I it's been a while since I've had it, so I, I can't compare. But other than what the Consigliere, which they released, very good cigar. Um, I think Rick Rodriguez got this one right. Which is good. I, I love Rick. He's a good friend, and I like to see him doing well. You know, and there's um, there's been cigars in the past where it's like, eh, okay, it's okay, but... And uh, this was a, a smart move for them. What what other kind of takeaways did you have from the show? Well, normally it's uh, you sometimes hear complaints about media guys out there looking for free stuff. Uh, which just for anybody watching who doesn't realize, I it cost us a lot of money to go to the show. Uh, I did the math. I spent probably over twenty dollars per cigar. Um, Yep. So samples aren't really free. There isn't really free stuff. When you do the math on what you spent to be there, missing work, things like that, it comes out to over about twenty dollars a stick. And uh, some of those are things that are going to retail for five bucks. Um, but normally the complaint has been in the past. There's a few. Normally it's the smaller internet media sites, not normally the CMA members. Um, that have gone there looking for free stuff. Uh, there wasn't that happening this year. I didn't hear any complaints from any of the, the manufacturers. The complaint I heard this year was because it was in Vegas, some of the retailers were like, hey, you know, let me bring a buddy or two. And it was uh, friends of retailers on the floor with retailer badges saying, hey, you got any free cigars? And uh, they weren't going to place any orders. They have no control over orders. And uh, that doesn't look good for anybody. Uh, that was something that bothered me kind of this year. You know, that actually has been a, something that's gone on for a long time. I think for whatever reason, it, it, now that basically they've beaten media into the point where we, well, we can't ask for free cigars, right? We can't ask for samples, which uh, if anyone from IPCPR is listening, I'd love to have a discussion with you to, to overturn that rule because – it's not so much for guys like JD and I because we're gonna uh, be honest with you. We we have relationships. We're gonna, we're gonna get the cigars. It's for the newer guys who are really trying to start out and do things the right way. It's a little tougher for them. And I've been in that. I've been on that end of the fence. I know that. So it, it is important. And, and like JD said, there's a lot of costs that go into going to the show. And oh, by the way, some of the cigars you get, they're, they're not the best samples either. So you're oh, not getting. Point. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, I mean, to be honest, look on our site. A lot of times. Uh, especially, um, I'm here in Houston at a bigger Stogie's is a bigger shop. That's my home shop. I can generally get stuff right when it comes out. And a lot of times by the time a manufacturer sent me a sample in the mail, I've already smoked and reviewed it and paid for it. Uh, in which case what we do at our site is we either use them in a giveaway or we donate them to cigars for warriors. Uh, it's just my own personal thing because I'm like, hey, look, it's property at Toast to Foot. I'm, it's not there for me to smoke on my own. Um, and that's just always been my feeling towards it. So a lot of the – if you look at our reviews, we disclose, and I know Coop does, anytime he's gotten anything from any manufacturer, technically you're supposed to legally. Yep. Um, some people don't. Uh, but we do. Coop does. Most of the other people, bigger guys do. And um, what we do with the – when we do that is we say, if you look at the majority of our reviews, most of them are things we paid for. Same and here. even if we did get free samples, we will say, uh, you know, we bought the cigars for this review. Samples were sent before it was posted and they were donated to Cigars for Warriors. Yeah. And for folks who, you know, look at some of the stuff that these, you know, our sites do review, this company, you know, some companies just tap the wire, doesn't give out samples. I mean, you may, if you see Pete, they'll hand you a cigar from time to time. Not, but in general, they don't have a program where they, they send out samples. The BIA is the same thing. So, I mean, we are purchasing. If you want to see those reviews, in 90% of the chances, we're purchasing that, so to speak. I mean, I, I even have some sponsors where I have to purchase the cigars. Well, so, Fuente, the Oscuro, or the, uh, you know, it came in that bright yellow box. Everybody wanted to try one. I, bought, I have a box personally. That's a cigar you're not going to get a sample of. But I wanted to review it because I knew everybody would want to know what it tasted like and what it was like. Uh, it was a little underwhelming, by the way. But, you know, those came from my own personal box. And uh, that's typically how a lot of that stuff, especially Fuente stuff, works. Yeah, I mean, Paul and I have actually 
Paul's a big Fuente. He's the big Fuente guy on the show, and he, I could tell you, uh, and and there's stuff he doesn't even put under the Stogie Geeks budget uh, on top of that. But I could tell you, you know, we we invest in Fuente. And the funny thing is, you go into the Fuente booth, and I did go to the Fuente booth um, this year. There's a sign, sorry, no samples. Well, most of the stuff also does go on my own personal budget rather than on the the site, just because, um, you know, I would have smoked it anyhow. Right, and that's what we kind of so, look at, yeah. If I was going to smoke it anyhow, I will, uh, I will generally pay for it myself. If it's something that I really don't have any desire to smoke on my own, but I think people are going to want to know about, then, uh, you know, it goes under the site, but that tends to be fairly rare. Yeah, and, yeah. I don't yeah. think people understand the cost of upkeep, servers, time away from family. You know, uh, media takes a lot of hits online, uh, and and guys don't quite realize. I mean, Coop, Coop, I I know he pulls over and posts stuff on the road because there's no way something is going online while I know Coop's in the car. <laughs> All of a sudden, there's this press release on Cigar Coop or this new piece of news. He had to have pulled over on the side of the road. I have this image of Coop at a Walmart with his computer, you know. Oh, there was a there was a rest stop in New Mexico. I think they thought I was nuts um, with that. But you know, it's again we, we're committed. You know, there's a lot of people who it took a long time to get people to send you information on cigars, uh, press releases. I mean, you you think asking I, it's easier sometimes to ask for a sample than a press release I, I, with some companies. So, you know, we do try to make sure we turn these things around quickly so folks at least the information is somewhat timely. And I, I never worry about being first with something. I just want to be timely with it. So that's kind of where a lot of that comes from as far as that goes. Um, but, yeah, we, you know, as far as um, – I thought with the media there was one interesting observation I had this year. And it was noticeable with a lot of people, and it was the absence of Cigar Dave. I would agree with that. And it, I don't know what happened, okay? But it was odd, first of all, that he wasn't there, all right? And, and we could say what we want, like him or hate him, right? The guy's been doing this for 20 years, okay? He's got very deep relationships in this business. Um, not only did he not have his, and he, he set up a production level over the past couple of years that I envy. It's the best production I've seen anyone do. It's got that ESPN uh, Sports Center desk feel um not only was there that not there he was not there and i went back and listened to the archives and it's almost no mention of ipcpr so i don't know what happened it, that's not a good thing it, it's just not a good thing having the biggest he's still one of the biggest guys i'm sure he's got some of the highest advertising rates out there as far as broadcasting goes he's not there that's not a good thing I would definitely agree. It's it's odd not to see the Cigar Dave booth there where he's uh, broadcasting live from the IPCPR, and uh, it was uh, it was definitely different. I mean, like I said, sometimes I would just see him barge into a booth or whatever. You know, just I'm, I'm Cigar Dave, blah blah blah. Not that I like that, and if I did that, I'd be thrown out of the show, right? So there was always two sets of rules. But I don't know if you could get away with it. I couldn't. No, but in fact, I won't even go there. I actually had a conversation with someone on this once um, who said, well, he's Cigar Dave. You're just Cigar Coop, you know. But, uh, you know, so I, I, I honestly was told that. I said, why is that okay? And it's not. And that, that was the answer. It wasn't an IPCPR person that told me. It was, it was a retailer. But, you know, the interesting thing is. Uh, I'm just the toasted make... foot guy. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, hey, wasn't there another one? Yeah, he's still around. Yeah. So all, all the companies that were suddenly feeding Cigar Dave, Exclusive information. Guess what? Now you don't have anyone chasing you down for that information because he wasn't there, and he didn't. He didn't. He's not doing anything on it right now. So it's it's a bad loss, and I think that's where some of these companies should look at. You know, in general, I would like to see a better. I'd like to see more of the podcasts at the show. It's it, there. I, the reasons I, I know there's costs involved in unions and stuff like that, but in general, to have no broadcast from that show this year. The, the, this is the biggest, the cigar industry's biggest event, and there's no broadcast. That, that I think that's if I had to just say I think it's a great show. That's a takeaway. I'd look at how can, how can that be better? How can that be made better? Yeah, is there a way to get Kiss My Ash Radio or somebody there? Right. I mean, Kiss My Ash has been there in the past. I mean, I know that it's harder for us to do this because 
we're trying like my role i look at me as uh you know i'm with the green visor and notepad and typewriter back in the back room i, I need to be on the go so to, for me and i only did one interview at the show this year and it was with hans christian hosar the ceo davidov i just don't have the it, it's a lot of work to do those interviews and i think there's a i think in general my feeling is i'm not the written word coming out of the show seems to be less and less with online media these days. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I generally uh, cover the show more as a travel journal type experience. Hey, this is what I did. These are the main booths I stopped by. And then I go back over some of the individual interesting booths over the next couple of weeks. Um, just because there are so many, you're never going to cover everything. No, I knew there are booths I didn't get to, and I'm sending out apology letters. Um, because at least from what we look at, we have to go to our sponsor booths. We have to go to our strategic partners. They're not sponsors, but they've been very good to us. Um, and then there's booths where I was trying to build the strength in the relationships there this year. So, you know, I, I tended to spend more time at the Padrones and the Fuentes and the J.C. Newmans and probably a lot of other online media people. Unfortunately, there were people who are friends of mine who have been very good to me, and I did not get to their booze, and, but I had all their information already. Unfortunately, I just didn't have the bandwidth to sit and hang out, and I, I feel bad on that. It's I wish I I wish the show was 10 days in a lot of ways so I could do that. I just can't do that. Yeah, I don't know if I, uh, my wife would let me get away with going for 10 days. <clears throat> so I'm kind of okay with four, but <laughs> I agree with you. You have, you have any other takeaways? Uh, well, there was that. Um, it seemed, you know, some booths, the big companies' booths all got bigger, whereas the smaller guys all got smaller. Do you, um, it seemed like General got smaller this year. I, I would say, to me at least, it looked like they took up about the same amount of space. See, they got rid of that big, they had that humidor in there last year that they got rid of. And I'm this, going back to two or three years ago when they had that foundry was a huge booth within itself. Well, that was 2012, I think, General had a gigantic booth. They had a trade show within the trade show. They had a trade they show with the trade show. Yeah. in 2012. There was the foundry booth, the CAO booth, the, and uh, that foundry booth with that table and the arm. and the, It was pretty impressive. Um, but in general, I agree with you. Um, I think there was some, I mean, I looked at what La Polina, did you see La Polina's booth this year? Yes. They had one of the biggest booths. I mean, I remember when Bill Paley was at the show six or seven years ago with a table and a La Polina banner. And now I look at that booth he's got. It was, yeah. So I, and, he, and he's definitely a guy who's looking to become bigger. I mean, there's no question. Well, I think the dropping out of, of some of the smaller guys allowed some of those bigger guys or medium-sized guys to expand their booths a little bit. Um, the other thing I found this year was there, there seemed to be no one cigar everybody was talking about, you know, uh, you and I went over this, uh, last year I ran into, um, Adam from kiss my ash radio and he said, uh, Hey, have you been to the Casada booth yet? Yeah, you got to try this cigar. This is Matilde Oscar. It's amazing. And, um, uh, I went there, tried it. Sure enough, it was it was definitely the cigar of the show last year. No, it was on nobody's radar going in, and afterwards everybody seemed to be talking about it. And uh, I think it was number two on Dojo's all time Maduro list. Yeah, it was. Our, uh, it was, you know, the, it was just released yeah. this year. It was the CMA cigar of the year. Uh, Seth Seth from, Seth from Federation had it as his number one. I had it as the number three. It was a very, high, but I agree that that cigar came out of nowhere. And we'll, while we'll get into our personal picks in a bit, I think the one cigar that I would say, if there was a buzz and it wasn't a, maybe by split decision, it wasn't like a knockout punch, like where it, I think Nick, Nick Malo's Tabernacle is the one I've heard most people talk about. See, I, I just felt like there wasn't, there was booths people said to swing by, you know, there was hey, visit the Cornelius and Anthony booth. Make sure you visit Foundation, which is Nick Melillo, um, Warped, Saka. But there was no, like, one cigar that it was like, hey, this cigar, you have to try. Yeah, and I remember, like, if you go back 2010, for example, Kirk Kendall at 724. Everyone was going to his booth, right? That was, I remember one year it was Alohio that was the big 
star of the show. Viaje had a had something going on back in two two thousand. So I've seen that, but yeah, there was no there was no real. I would say you're right. There wasn't anyone go to that booth. You have to kind of try that that cigar type of thing this year. And I think that's just because of quantity. I think there was just a lot of quantity this year. Yeah, I think it could be partially because of all the stuff that was released by yeah. everybody, and especially. It was harder, I think, maybe for the smaller guys to get noticed because so many retailers and media people had to spend so much time at General and Altadis and Davidoff and things because of all the new releases. Yeah, I mean, General and, and Davidoff and Altadis, they take up a little over a day of my time. Oh, yeah. You, and, and it's a lot of, lot of uh, debriefing work this year for sure. Was there a company that you would say this year had a had a show that was better than you expected? Um, better than I expected. I mean, Cornelius and Anthony is probably the one that wasn't on anybody's radar. Um, I had smoked their cigars. I really liked them. Um, I thought the uh, the Cornelius and the Daddy Mac, which were out before the show, were two of the better cigars I'd smoked this year. Um, I thought. They were kind of like Espinosa was last year, where that booth seemed to be busy a lot and people were there a lot, and and that was one of the booths you had to meet. Um, there were a couple others in that range, you know, warped this year. Last year they had gotten started to get there, as far as hey, you got to swing by this booth, you got to talk to these guys. This year, after the release of the Flor de Val, the Skyflower, the Futuro, all that. Warped was a place you had to go to. It was a booth that, you know. Um, but oddly, I mean, as much as people said, "Hey, I like the new Warped stuff," it wasn't wasn't a "you have to be here" sort of. These are amazing cigars. Try them. Um, Caldwell was busy again. Uh, yep, I, I was busy I, last year. Uh, last two years, that booth has been swamped. Espinosa is another one that always seems to to be busy the last two years. Uh, but as far as new stuff this year, Cornelius and Anthony had to have been, at least for me, the standout new company of the show. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, when I look at a booth that I, that had a big uptick, this isn't a new company, but E.P. Carrillo, the revamping of the portfolio, had a lot of people in that booth. Um, I think they got some killer packaging. Last year, I felt they had a very slow show. I, I just felt the boot activity was down. Um, they were actually in a better location last year. This year they were more towards the end, um, and I think that that boost, uh they needed a um, they needed kind of a kick, and I think they they got it. I think that packaging is um, incredible. I've had some of the cigars as well. I think they're I think that, that was um, a surprise as well. So you know that one I would say is the one that stood out. Um, the other company that I would say new company there's a company called sereno cigars made by someone named tony sereno who's making their cigars um at the la corona factory uh that's omar gonzalez's factory who made hr um i've smoked their cigars i think it's really good i think they would have of all the new companies um i think some people were really and i didn't get to that booth by the way but i've smoked their stuff and it was one of the people i owe an apology to but uh, we will get them on the show but yeah great I think they had some really good cigars, and I think that people took notice of that. Um, and then the other thing I noticed this year, which is kind of the last sort of takeaway I had, was there was a lot less vape people and a lot less uh, hookah people. There were two big hookah companies right in the middle, and, um, you know, they seemed somewhat busy because there were a lot of pretty girls at those booths. Um, but in general... Last year, there was a whole area set aside for, for hookah and vape. And the year before, they were intermixed. And, yeah, and that was a disaster. Yeah. Uh, the whole place smelled like strawberries um, or whatever they, they were vaping on at the time. But um, this year, it seemed like there was a whole lot less of that. Uh, there was a face cream guy. Did you run into the face cream guy? No, I didn't. I, I don't know what the, the face cream guy was doing at the IPCPR, but there was a booth and they had cosmetics and stuff. And every time I walked by, the guy wanted to hand me a sample. It was like walking through the mall. And uh, at one point when I first walked by, he's like, you know, excuse me, sir, can I ask you a question? And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, I figured another cigar guy. 
He says, what do you use on your skin? I'm like, I'm a fat guy who smokes cigars. I don't use anything on my skin other than shaving cream. Uh, you know, he's like, oh, try our, come on. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure what the, the hell he was doing there, but that was one that threw me. There was a, uh, a random face cream booth. I, I didn't I get that. face cream samples from my wife. I didn't get that one, but I got the portable back massager and got a heavy push on sales with that where actually they want to cash. Let me just say something. What the, I'm going to just point by why IPCPR are these people there? Okay. This is the type of, this is a trade show. We talk about having business and being professional. I, and I'm again, I think had a great show. Why are these people there? This is the type of stuff I think that just, they don't belong at the trade show. And, and I don't need someone selling me a back massager asking for cash, giving me a heavy, like they basically the sell was almost as, um, it was almost like a timeshare sell I was getting. I'm like, finally, I just walked away in the middle of the thing because I, I have other things to do. But that, I just don't understand. Same with this face cream. Why is, why is this stuff there is beyond? Do you remember they had the Extends people there a few years ago? No. Yeah, they had so, something. That booth or that, they, that year? They had oh – yeah, yeah, this that, was all like yeah, – they did. <laughs> so, no, that was uh, – yeah, that was um, interesting. Um, was there a company? I would have had to tell them, uh, don't worry, it's huge. It's substantial, like my hands, you know? Yeah, I mean. Screw with, just to screw with them. They had they had sample packs. And then, <laughs> I'm not kidding, this was at the show. This had to be, oh, I think it was Orlando or 2011 in Vegas. Uh, so, yeah, it had to be 11 because I wasn't there that year. Yeah. I and all, yeah, so. I just, like I said, I don't really think that this is going to make or break the show. I mean, um, <laughs> yes, you know, I, you know, I understand you want to sell booze and stuff, but the, the no, part- I, it doesn't make or break it. I just thought it was kind of humorous that they, I mean, there was a lot less of the vape stuff and the, the hookah stuff, but there was just this random, you know, the other thing I noticed a lot is there was a lot more focus on pairing cigars with uh, alcohol. Oh Yeah. Be it, you know, Dictator or Gurkha's box set that they just came out with or, uh, you know, uh, Hammer and Sickle, everybody. Perdomo was doing it as well. Yeah, Perdomo had in there. Perdomo, who in my opinion had one of the nicest booths I've I've seen this year. They, I know they had their beer cigars, but they were showing other pairings and their display cabinets were with, with their new killer packaging. I was real impressed with But I, as far as takeaways go, I would say that's about it, you know. What, was there a company that you think this year, um, was there a hit and miss this year, like swing and a miss this year with any company that came into the show and you just think missed the mark? Um, you know, I'm sure there is. Um, you know, Tatawahe didn't seem to have as much buzz as normal. They had a lot of product. Even last year with the the Latelier and stuff and the Veracu, there was a lot of buzz around that booth. This year there was the Skinny Monsters um, in individual boxes. And people seemed to be looking at them and liking it, but you had to order all Tatawahe's other stuff in order to get them. And, you know, it, it, it became uh, – it was odd. I didn't, I didn't feel the same – love for Tatawahe that normally you felt. Um, there was a book. I did think um, Christoph had a, a probably the funniest cigar of the show. Pissed off Christoph. The pissed off Christoph. Good cigar. I've smoked it. And uh, you actually have to look closely to see it, but there's a an angry emoji in the O of uh, pissed off. And it's just an a, a angry emoji face. And uh, I thought that was pretty funny. And it was unique. Uh, I like that idea. Um, otherwise, it, I can't say there was any real big miss. You know, um, a lot of stuff was all, it, it, it seemed, there were some booths that seemed very similar to last year. The focus seemed the same. The, the cigars seemed the same. The look of the booth seemed the same. Which, you know, when you figure out how much these booths cost, makes sense. But, um, there wasn't a real big miss. Uh, Jose Blanco with the Freya, you know, there wasn't anything new at that booth. There was nothing. And I love Jose. He had and, the box presses, uh, but he had three new cigars 
that basically didn't make it to the show. But he's got yeah, three new cigars coming out. There was nothing there, though. And, um, you know, I would say that was probably the biggest disappointment is, is a booth where there isn't anything. Um, there's no draw for, to bring retailers to the booth. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's about it as far as... Uh, See, there was an interesting observation I'll make with that. There was this one company, you know, you know, so for years, companies like Padron and Fuente could have a booze and not come out with something new. And they'd be busy booze. I, I think My Father's Cigars is now in that category. They had a busy booze, but they didn't have anything new with the show that they were showcasing. There is some new stuff they have coming later this year as, as part of that, um, you know, stuff that's going to be available. But, but in general, you walked into that booze, you didn't see anything new. And I think that that's showing where Pepin is kind of heading, right? He's kind of getting into that club, so to speak, of the Fuente and the Padron, where you can you get to a point where you don't need to do that. But it's with those Fuentes and the Padrones, it's retailers tend to have appointments there because they have to carry those cigars. Yeah, that's and right. That's my father's headed that way. It's not, I'm here because there's a lot of buzz about this. No. Um, whereas... You know, uh, La Polina or um, Cornelius and Anthony or, or one of those guys um, last year in Bombay was real busy. And, and Espinosa with the Laranja, it was because I have to have this cigar. There's a lot of buzz about it. Yeah. And not, I carry this because people want it and are going to ask for it no matter what. Yep. Um, one, one other takeaway I do have um I actually, I was at the Drew Estate booth, and, um, you know, one thing I did get to meet was the uh, the changing of the guard. I got to meet the new CEO, Glenn Wolfson. Um, Sam Morales introduced me to him, and I talked to him for a short time. And I don't know what happened. You know, Mike Salucci was really, he was kind of running the business piece of Drew Estate for folks that don't know. You know, even though Jonathan Drew is more of the, the face of the company, from a business standpoint, it was Mike Salucci. And now Glenn Wolfson's kind of going into that role, who they brought in. And I had a real favorable impression. I usually can read a guy real well. I had a favorable impression with the guy, and I think he'll mesh well with the Drew Estate culture, which is m more important. So... Um, that was kind of an interesting takeaway. Obviously, this you know, with, with you know, any any time there's acquisitions, you know, changes eventually happen. I mean, so they were able to keep things pretty steady for two years. Now they have some new leadership. But I was impressed with the, with Glenn Wolfson. I think he's a very down to earth guy, and I think he gets it. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I thought that booth was, uh, you know, that was one that has already entered that kind of uh, territory of we have to go to this booth um, no matter what. I was, um, you know, the other thing I thought was odd this year overall was a lot of people were releasing flavored, well, they call them flavored, infused cigars, which I'm not a fan of. I don't generally review them. I don't have problems with people smoking them as long as they're not smoking it next to me while I'm smoking something really good. Um, but you know, Miami, um, did, uh, upsetters with, um, with Nick Melillo. Um, you know, you still had new Drew estate stuff. There were a couple other people, Espinosa, um, released a flavor, or an infused yes. cigar. But, but and, Espinosa, yeah, Espinosa is an yeah. odd choice with the FDA thing looming. Well, here's what Espinosa though. That was, it, it seems odd on the surface, but it's a predicate Brand, uh, brand that they're kind of really they're distributing it. It's some company out of the Dominican that makes it. It's not Eric's yes. factory that's making it, and it's a predicate. It's a pre predicate brand. Um, so think of from Eric's standpoint, if he was ever going to tap into the flavored market, it, um, what better way to do it? Um, now at some point he doesn't have to invest in doing that. So if the FDA goes away, he can always the distribution can you know it's no loss for him. But it kind of was a, a an interesting win there. Yeah, um, my thought on it was if if the infused flavored stuff starts becomes like clove cigarettes, where there's no longer you can sell what's in your inventory. It's on this date, it's gone no more. Um, and the FDA hasn't kind of said anything about that, but 
I think that's one of the things that might actually go through and happen is they may just say, hey, look, no more. And the, the acids that are on your shelf, you can't even sell them. You can go in the back and smoke them yourself, but that's it. And uh, so I thought it was an odd sort of choice for some of those guys to release new stuff, but maybe it's just me. I, I want to get back to Nick Malolo for a second because I thought this was real interesting. So he announced the upsetter is back, I'd say, in May. It was right around when the FDA announcement came. The first thing I looked at the packaging, I thought of acid. I mean, I'm sorry, Nick, I did. Um, but it was advertised as a Jamaican, kind of this Jamaican project. I mean, you read the press release. There was nothing about that thing being infused. There was no, this was a, Nick going into Jamaican tobacco. Yes. Then... Right before the show, another odd announcement, the brand goes, distribution is given to Miami Cigar. Kind of an odd thing. And then they bring in a separate brand manager in Rick Ardito. Thought it was odd, right? But right before the show or on the eve of the show, it comes out that this is an infused cigar, right? Could anyone else but Nick Malo have gotten away with, with that? Because I'm telling you, if, if I could think of company, the lot company would be crucified for doing that. And I'm not knocking Nick. I'm just saying not a lot of people would probably be able to do it. And it was, it was, it was an interesting strategy, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you on all that. I think... Um, and I love Nick. He's a friend of the show. He's a friend, I mean, and I'm not trying to knock Nick, but it, I mean, I, I, you know, I could just think of Pete. You know, imagine Pete Johnson. He'd probably get killed for that. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, first off, the packaging... Well, the the band and all that, yeah, I'm I'm with you on the. It looks very acid esque. The uh, the thing I thought was funny was at the Miami booth. Somebody said, unlike most uh, flavored or infused cigars, uh, we started with very very high quality tobacco. So even without that, it's a very good cigar. And uh, all I could think is great. So you ruined a good cigar, um, you know? Right. I don't know. I thought it was an odd choice, though. Like I said, no one's now coming out of the show. No one's talking about that being a Jamaican project. It's being talked about as an infused project. Yeah. Which, which I found fast. I don't think I ever remember anything like that um, going like I've never seen anything like that happen at the trade show ever. Yeah, it was definitely new. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of getting up on the hour. I think we're at the hour. What I want to do is, um, before we go to break, I just want to tell folks, um, we're going to do a couple giveaways tonight. Um, they're going to be uh, two, I'm going to be giving away two IPCPR five packs along with um, a Smoke Naked t-shirt. I'll have details of that later on in the show. But this is a, because of FDA, I have to get these out this week. So this is only going to be offered for our live audience tonight. Um, so with that, we will take a break. We'll come back without definition. 